were very um, uh, clear and they explained the model, which is without any doubt a unique model that has developed in the Middle East. Uh, and um, just to give you uh, an idea about this, uh, about um, six, seven months ago, the Israeli newspaper Aaretz uh, developed uh, uh, a whole um, supplement to this model with the title The Only Democracy in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I had the privilege of being with the Kurds in the army camp in Turkey and I have seen how the movement operates uh, the gender equality is uh, enormous, the representation and the leadership is equal men and women, very sophisticated people. <coughs> uh, when they were visited by um, Senator McCarthy, he said, Gee, these people have the right to succeed. This is one of the most uh, staunch Republican senators, was extremely impressed by the democratic practice. Uh, this has to, the model has to be also understood to be very different from the model advocated by the other uh, uh, Kurdish autonomy in Iraq, which is a very different, is a kind of more traditional, conservative, territorial kind of autonomy. The bodies are organized according to the representation of the different co all communities that are uh, inhabiting the area are invited to send representatives and they have to be a man and a woman. In this regard, uh, I think it is, a, it is a very interesting experience, but it is an experience that is under severe threat uh, of destruction. Uh, uh, the, Kurd, the Turkish regime in, intent upon destroying it because they perceive it uh, not only as a threat to the provinces in the south of Turkey, which is not that true that correct, but it is an example of democracy that the uh, system led by uh, Mr. Ocalan, uh, Mr. Uh, um, uh, uh, Erdogan, uh, will not uh, 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 entertain because it would mean in the destruction of his authoritarian regime. So in that regard, uh, I think this is an important uh, uh, creation, it's an important uh, uh, model that needs to be protected and have very few protectors. Recently, uh, as you, all of you who read newspapers will know, the uh, US, uh, the government or the administration of uh, Mr. Trump has redrawn uh, the, the U.S. support from this movement and is left in more or less at the mercy of uh, the Turkish army. The threats uh, to them there, also they have a very interesting relation with the uh, uh, regime of Fatih uh, 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 Assad in Syria. There has never been any kind of aggression towards that regime uh, and they will always consider that uh, the state of Syria is a, is, a, is a single state and that they will not, they are not interested in changing in any way or form uh, the structure of the state. They only want to create a system of autonomy and representative democracy within the early North Syria. Finally, uh, it is interesting that we had this session after the session on Israel Palestine and I have the feeling that perhaps we could learn from them and we can also uh, see the commonalities 
of the various movements in, in this, uh, this could be a project to be developed uh, uh, in the future. Uh, I just need to, uh, I thank you for the very exhaustive presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. proposal for peace between Israel and Palestine and it comes from the same source it's it's more or less the same the same model because um, Ujulan is is uh, very in, uh, he's, he, he made a lot of reading in the prison right and and he became very familiar with the matriarchal legacy and there is a, a close connection between uh, uh, Kurdistan, Kurds are people, and our network of matriarchal studies. Not, it's, it's not incidental, because we are very close in, in thinking, and our origin, our original thought in, uh, comes from the same source. And just two weeks ago, there was a Kurdistan, uh, I think two or three weeks ago, there was a Kurdistan um, conference in Rome that one of our our main speakers, uh, Genevieve Vaughan, was invited to talk there. Um, so what I'm saying is that what I'm saying is that I came up with a, not exactly the, the Rojava or the Kurdistan model, but very close to it, and I suggested it as a as a as a as a proposal for for resolving the Israeli uh, the Jewish Palestinian conflict in in Greater Palestine. And I think this is a great model. So thank you very much. You make me much more, uh, much more hopeful. <laughs> if I may just rephrase a little bit, the way I see it is you're talking about a territorial autonomy model on a foundation on non-territorial autonomy. This is how I see it. Because when I was reading your work before, I was asking myself, is this really non-territorial autonomy or is it territorial? But now I think I understand better. And um, what, what I think you're suggesting is sort of a very sophisticated matrix of territorial and non-territorial organizational institutional setup, which um, then, in a sense, these two types of autonomies raise questions to me about effectiveness and sustainability. Uh, I think the model is very idealistic because I see a I see a territory of thousands, if not more, community organizations, uh, whether these are commissions, councils, whatever that need to agree in every different instance about how to essentially run the public administration of this territory. And let's face it, public administration is territorial. I, I see almost every housewife going to a commission meeting twice a day, one for the school, one for the sport club, one for politics, one for the gender equality, and how will she be doing this? And how will you, in those areas where you're saying the commissions will be mixed, if I understood it correctly, what are you going to do if you have a 4-5 vote about a school and the jurors of five votes and another ethnic group or religious or <coughs> linguistic group has four votes, who, who decides? So my question would be, for instance, in education, how many different kinds of schools will you have and what will it cost? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going maybe too far now, but uh, that's why I'm saying it's, it, it's a beautiful thought but it's idealistic and it seems to me it's going to cost a lot of money and I thought I could ask where is that coming from and then just one comment to yours on extraterritoriality I'm not sure how you see this because in this particular case if you use that term I bet you're going to have a huge group of UN lawyers hacking at you, 
saying who is exerting the extraterritorial power in this case. And this is not what you want, because you're talking about not having any concern with borders, which I also think is a bit idealistic, especially in this case. Had it been in Germany where I come from, nobody would have shed a tear about it. But in this particular case, if you say no concerns of borders, people are going to say, wait a minute. But how do you plan to explain <coughs> extraterritorial as a concept in this case to a UN lawyer who's saying extraterritorial extraterritorial power is basically almost a criminal act in international law. Hmm. Yeah. The way I heard your presentation, both of you, was not as a as, as presenting an, an, uh, an idea. I, I, I read it more as an empirical report, which uh, so in, in some respects we have, we understand it differently because what I saw here is a report of something that is tangible and is going on, rather than a, a model, which in, by the way would expand the difference between Palestine and Kurdistan, because what uh, Erela said yesterday was an idea that has no material foundation or sufficient material foundation, right? Whereas what we see here is exactly the opposite. I come, the one other thing that I want to say, because I come from the study of the Middle East, so I'm a Middle Eastern, I study the Arab world, it, it's, uh, uh, I mean, I'm very proud in some respect that, that, that Kurdistan, let me say Kurdistan because I think that's, that's how it should be defined, uh, generates such a globally rigorous uh, model for reconciling dividing society that is really a, a source of proud for the discipline or for the area, you know what I mean? I mean, we, it's not often that the Middle East contributes yeah. uh, models or, or, or theories that go and travel beyond. I can think of Ranger State, I can think of the theory of ethnocracies, all kinds of uh, knowledge that came out of the Middle East and then was applied in other places. I mean, you know, but, but it doesn't happen that often. So this is why I find the, the, the presentation interesting, scholarly speaking, but also very stimulating in terms of uh, uh, the ability to move forward uh, in many uh, sections of the Middle East, and we know that it's uh, a bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, problematic. The, my, uh, just one little little question is about Ocala. I mean, what? I mean, I was under the impression that the, his ideas were written in the 90s. Uh, am I am I incorrect? When was he born? I mean, I, I was surprised to see him and, and Judith Butler in the same the same club with all the respect to Julian Butler. Yeah, I have a respect to Julian Butler, but hello. It's, it's, uh, so, I mean, I think that he is a little bit, uh, he predates her, no? In terms of his uh, ideas about the issues, but maybe I'm wrong. Initially, it was about mobilizing women, creating a kind of a free woman, liberated woman identity. That kind of moved on and on, and now, there's a, a whole generation of Kurdish women leaders uh, and they want equality and the, it's a his, historically, I mean it's a conservative society so women had, were not uh, in a position of power before but what happened is the, war, the conflict has created conditions to transform the society so now these ideas are shared by a great number of people. This is not purely territorial or non-territorial. And I wasn't thinking about non-territorial autonomy. About I was thinking about the model. Then I came across Efrain's work on NTA. And that's how I see exactly that there are so many similarities. So that's how I kind of connected. But in the academic discourse, uh, this uh, academic works on this model, it's not, I'm one of the few who say that it's an NTA. Others don't actually agree with that. So it's a, it's the, the, the way to define it isn't very, it, it, there are differences or there, there, there are discussions about it. In terms of, but yeah, so there are features which are territorial and features which are non-territorial. And I think if it was to be implemented, I, across basically it's a model there are areas which are left 
quite uh, it's not articulated very clearly and that's a, there's a reason for that the reason is that for this model to become a reality it needs to be agreed by the states and that this nitty gritty will be decided with a, when there's a debate or when there's a negotiation with the state so there are areas to be to, they're left unclear or expressed in very general terms and the, I mean the questions you mentioned uh, when you go to the sort of the specifics of how this will become uh, operational it is basically a, a direct democracy model and it's supposed to organize the society and every citizen are supposed citizens are supposed to be active participating citizens and it's a top it's, it's, so that's the, the whole body that will become the Kurdish uh, entity is constituted through that so citizens joining together from bottom up processes uh, but it's 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 a, for the non terry for the trans it's a transnational dimension it's not just about Kurds in Turkey because Kurds are just divided so he wants to bring some sort of Kurdish create Kurdish insti institutions that operate across these borders and that is uh, whether states accept that or not is, is, is a big question. It, yeah. Um, sorry, I, I, I know your questions deserve more responses, but this I'm going to stop there. But concerning Öcalan, Öcalan was born in 1947, and from 1970s, early 70s onwards, he's been writing he formulated the solution to Kurdish question. It was a national liberation movement. So he used to read a lot of Marxist texts, a lot of literature produced around Vietnam, Angola, to the anti-colonial movements. And so he kind of synthesized that and applied to the Kurdish uh, question in the Middle East. And the idea, the solution was to create a, a pan, uh, to create a, a socialist state in Greater Kurdistan. But from 80, sort of late 80s, early 90s onward, after the collapse of Soviet Union, the, this, that national liberation discourse became not uh, effective. And so he came up with new models. And <coughs> initially, it was about accommodating Kurdish rights in Turkey. There was a process of, of possible negotiation in the <coughs> early 90s, but then the main interlocutor was Furgut Özal, who he, was, he died suddenly. So there was a con intensification of conflict, and Öcalan was captured in, um, in Nairobi, Kenya in 99. So when he was in prison, he started to think more deeply about the solution and he's not allowed to uh, kind of send information out. The only way he could do it was through t uh, texts that he developed as um, defense texts against for the courts in Turkey, but also the European courts. So that allowed him to develop a new discourse. Mm -hmm. And essentially it's about, it, it has, I, I've done it elsewhere and I can't really talk so much in detail here, but the model developed through, uh, throughout time, so it's 99, 2002, 2003, 2005, gradually it crystallized. And the ideas that he drew from are leftists, yeah. Bukholdians, and anarchists, um, and it's about democratizing the republic and creating community-based community organizations so that it's, it's a kind of, it's like liberalizing republic. It's, I think what he's trying to do is philosophically trying to combine liberalism with republicanism, but also communitarianism. That's the kind of the bottom line. And then radical democracy. So a lot of black law and move uh, a lot of Zizek yeah. and 
Patla, uh, Benedict Anderson, he defines mm, a democratic nation and his definition of a democratic nation is quite similar to how Benedict Anderson defined a nation. Mm. So, so he's, he's, I don't think he's a philosopher as such, I think he's a strategist. So he reads all these books and processes it and applies to the Kurdish question to come up with a framework that will resolve the Kurdish question. When, 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 when someone grew up in the 1960s, 1970s in Turkey, what, what would you, what he or she, what would he or she read if you're in somehow in a progressive movement? You, you would read Stalin, because Stalin, that was translated. There was not much other literature on, from the socialist or Marxist tradition for Stalin. And what we see with, uh, with Erjelam, who came to know socialism through Stalin, what we see in Erjelam is that in the 1980s and 1990s, he started to develop a state critique um, based on his own experiences, based on how, what he, how he read developments in the world. The state critique. When he was imprisoned, or after he was imprisoned in 1999, with the excess he had to libraries, to reading in the context of his defense, he started to formulate a positive answer on the state critique he had. And he used for that book Chin and, and others who somehow informed him or inspired him about that positive alternative. Um, one of the thinkers he also read, uh, the philosopher, so historian, was uh, Ferdinand Brodel mm -hmm. and the long durée. And the long durée also brought him back to the matriarchal uh, uh, um, issue, or the issue of gender inequality. And one of the things which you see evolving within the PKK is, or in Erdogan's fault, is that gender inequality is foundational for all the inequalities um, we uh, have around us. So this resulted within the PKK to the organization of separate organizations of women in order to be able to organize them separately for men to address these kinds of inequalities. That process that started at the end of the 1990s and continued throughout the 2000s not without opposition. Within the PKK, there was strong opposition also against this development. But somehow, uh, the women in the movement, with support of others, managed to push through. But that was a struggle. Um, of course, when you look to the organization of the administration, it's very complex. It's, there's a myriad of committees and councils of different level, and then when you look at it, you think, how could this work? Uh, it's, it's difficult to understand how it could work, but somehow it works. I'm, I'm, just to give you a small example, I'm from a university in the Netherlands, which has background as an agricultural university. So, at some point in time, uh, we, we, had a, we had a research on agriculture in northern Iraq, in the KRG region, the Kurdish region, and in, uh, and in Rojava. And when we look at the Kurdistan re regional government uh, in northern Iraq, who are independent in practice since 1991, they do not have a functional agricultural economy. Everything is imported. Then when we look to how the agricultural economy is organized in NES, we see a working economy. And in spite of an, in, of an embargo by Turkey, the problems they have with Assad, the closing of the borders by the Kurdish movement in northern Iraq, with which the relation is very strained, they manage to organize their agriculture and to feed the population. It's a simple example maybe, but it shows that somehow they found a way to work uh, with all those committees and, 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 and councils in an effective way. That they are, they are effective in feeding the population, something which that more 
superficially more simple system you have in, uh, in, uh, in the KRG region did not manage to do until, uh, until, uh, until now. And I look to what they do in a, uh, from a, I don't know, from a sociological perspective, and then what you see with the establishment of the councils and the network of communities, it, that, it doesn't stop at the border. So when um, Shengal, uh, the, the, the area where the Yazidi uh, were displaced and enslaved by, uh, by ISIS, when that area was liberated, partly also by forces uh, related to the PKK, they also started to organize themselves on basis of that model of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of councils and committees, also making relations through the border with those at the Syrian side. So it, in that sense, it cuts through borders. Uh, and in that way, it's also extraterritorial. It, it doesn't take borders as an, as an object of opposition, of an object of concern, but in a way, it renders them uh, irrelevant. And maybe they are able to render them irrelevant because they do not take them as an object of opposition, because they are concerned with something different. You know, this area is rich with natural resources. And uh, my question is about how, who manages these resources, especially oil, and how, and what is the relation with the center? There, there seems to be an opportunity to test powers and hypothesis about the awakening of the non-historical relations here. And uh, in order to do that, really, you, you would have to, uh, uh, so, so for, I'm not a, uh, at all an expert in the region, uh, so I'm wondering what, to what extent are the Iraqi and the, the Syrian Kurdians, Kur Kurdish people, uh, do they share a common heritage? Uh, and the second part of the question would be, uh, um, so to test Bauer's hypothesis, I think you would have to, the question would be, to what extent do the Syrian and the, Kur and the Iraqi Kurdish people come together? But in order to ask this question properly, you would, you would have to bracket the, the contemporary political issues. Uh, so uh, I, I suppose there are allegiances because of the political situation now. Uh, but if you if you cancel out, if you bracket these these allegiances, do these uh, Syrian and, and Iraqi populations do they come together? The, the only thing I know is that the, for example, for the exploitation of oil, they have established uh, committees of professionals and experts who run the uh, refineries. Um, and um, well, as a matter of fact, most of the uh, most of the oil um, they uh, uh, they refine uh, goes to uh, goes to Assad. That's the uh, that's the only to uh, to Damascus. That's the only uh, I think um, um, party to which they are able to uh, to uh, to sell. The only most important. Let's say that way. Yeah. But the, yeah, the money they get is, I think, shared by the administration, but also tribes have some claims, so they try to kind of divide it in that term. I think 60%, the co-chair of the administration was in London, I managed to speak to her, so 60% of the oil revenues comes to the NES, the other 40% goes to tribes and other, other actors in the region. Well, yeah. Well, uh, the has nothing to do. They they buy they buy it. They right. paid money. Mm -hmm. So all the money, all the oil is used for the people in the region. And concerning the Kurds, as I mentioned, they have a they are part. They, there's a feeling that they're Kurds. Uh, they are a nation despite being divided. But uh, and also Kurds in Syria were they they've taken big part in. Kurdish nationalist mobilization in Turkey, but also in, si in Iraq throughout the time, throughout history. And the sense that they are part of a single nation is quite strong. Uh, but also the divisions or the, the imposition of the borders has created a, a great frustration where the developments in that state influence the developments in Kurdish society. Uh, 
so they are politically divided and fragmented. And Iraqi Kurdish, the dominant party in Iraqi Kurdistan is the Kurdistan Democratic Party, which on pan-Kurdish terms is in competition with the PKK. And that translates into taking kind of hostile action actions towards Kurds in Syria. Because the main political party is kind of ideologically affiliated with the PKK. But it's a, it's a very, very complex uh, situation. They do come together, but not really if they have to. But over the past two, three years, Kurds in Iraq became more kind of pan kurdish because Turkey played a very, very negative role in the uh, referendum and afterwards what happened. Turkey threatened to cut, cut all trade and embargo Kurdistan region, which would have stifled the Kurdistan region. But that kind of created the sense that our enemies are united against us, so we need to kind of start working together. That sense is gaining strength. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you have any other questions, we could talk after the after lunch. But thank you very much for your time. And <laughs>